name's Arjun, and I'm currently studying my MA in Visual Communication at the Royal College of Art, and I'm also a co-founder of Studio Hype. So throughout both my personal and studio practice, I'm currently looking at ways of uh, bridging the gap between dialogue, design, and activism. As throughout the majority of my career as a social designer, I've often been looking at, well, I've been thinking a lot about the kind of relationship between communication and ethical design, and recently I came to realize that there's a bit of a kind of uh, contradiction between the intentions of both of them. And the reason for this is because the one-way nature of broadcast within communication often excludes the audience's input, therefore placing the subject matter and more importance than the person viewing the piece itself. So essentially, when we start to create, when we start to communicate, we're actually communicating our own intentions as truth, and therefore we're trying to impose our views onto somebody else rather than listening to what they're saying in one way. So when I'm starting to think about this, I think, well, perhaps dialogue could be an alternative way for engaging with socio-political work in ethical context. As because dialogue, through dialogue, you can create a two-way channel, and there's a horizontal hierarchy between the designer, the subject, and the audience. And also, it allows you to collaborate with the audience to create solutions rather than imposing one view on them. And therefore, you can make work that begins to listen and respond as well. And through doing this, I started to think about dialogical design as a possible way of designing for socio-political context. Uh, and through doing so, hopefully, you'll be able to create work that is, becomes ethical by both subject and by nature, as it begins to place both the subject matter and the audience in the same uh, level of importance. When I started to look into this, I started to think about how dialogical design could work, and I wrote a case for it where I started to outline three, three main points where dialogical design could exist. The first is to create context, the second is human impression, and the third is real-time interaction, all of which I'll go through throughout the rest of this presentation. Um, but to begin with, just to give a bit of context to some of my work, in early 2016, my mum wrongfully had her disability benefits taken away from her from the British government. And this put a lot of strain on uh, us as a family, on her in particular. So myself and my sister were trying to help her out, trying to support her the way we could, but we're currently studying, so this made it pretty hard, actually. And a lot of the time, it put a lot of strain on my mom. She couldn't pay rent, her bills, sometimes struggling to find money for food and basic necessities. So. And, and this is something that's happening to a lot of people in the UK. And, and in some extreme cases, have led to people, disabled people, sick and disabled people dying, which is just awful. And like, this is something that Ken Loach has documented in his film, I, Daniel Blake. And also, so in, in 2016, 65% of sick and disabled people who were denied support from the British government were found to have been wrongfully denied. 65% of people. And in the same year, the United Nations deemed the British government to be in grave or systemic violations of disabled people's human rights. With all this happening around, with the people around me and the people I know, my friends and my family, I started thinking, you know, what could I do as a designer to try and make some sort of difference, if any? And this is kind of where I started to think about how dialogical design could come into play, where you can start to create work that, you know, starts to include the audience as ethical by both subject and by nature. So the first point of dialogical design is to create context. And essentially what this means is to like create, looking for designers to create places of hier horizontal hierarchy where the designer, the subject, and the audience are placed in equal importance, and therefore you're allowed to, able to create a dialogue with the participant rather than communicating at them. Therefore creating work that listens and responds as well as communicates. So this is something that myself and a friend, Ben Redgrove, started to do with a project called Rights in Our Games, where we collaborated with DPEC, uh, who are disabled, they're called Disabled People Against Cuts, who are a London-based activist group, uh, where we created Rights in Our Games. And uh, Rights in Our Games is an alternative online protest tool created in response to the struggle many sick and disabled people had to physically make it to a protest. And um, so this is something that was seen when DPAC protested in the lobby of Parliament um, earlier last year. At the time, they were protesting a recent benefit cut that was about to take place, and a lot of people all over the country had their voices on, were talking online and wanted to attend the protest. But when it actually came to it, not many people were physically able to make it. So this is something that me and Ben started to think about, and we started to think about how we could create an alternative way of protesting online, where we pull the best bits of offline protests and the best bits of online protests in one space. So offline being the ability to co-create visuals, have a, have a communal voice, and a sense of community, whereas the online protest being the ability to join people from all over the country and have the voices heard all over the world. an online protest tool called Rights Not Games, which uh, essentially allows a thousand people to live stream themselves into one site, having all their voices heard and kind of bringing them together all over the country. And when you first get on the website, you hear all their voices collectively, but then as you move the cursor over the top, you get each individual story. Therefore, allowing the, both the participant and the subject matter, matter to be able to engage with the subject in a meaningful way and have their own um, output as they engage with the piece. So at the same time as this, uh, we were launching this to coincide with the Paralympics, and um, Nothing against the Paralympics, they were really for it, but it was more because one of the sponsors, ATOS, is, uh, was behind the Paralympics, and 
essentially what we did, we ended up creating 20 Twitter bot activists, which uh, then went out there and spread the word online. Whenever they found a hashtag, they went out and sent the website, and then also a little call to action for the participants. So through doing this, we started to see ways in which part, uh, dialogical design become a more ethical way of engaging both the subject matter and the audience. The second is... Uh, human impression. So for something to become dialogic, it's really important for it to be, uh, for the piece to be considered an extension of themselves, and therefore uh, their own moral, pra their moral compass as well. So that way when you put the piece out there, the piece is able to exist uh, as a part of you, rather than just a design piece itself. So this is something that I started to think about with Adia Decision Maker, which, started to, which was based off the kind of discussion around the current role of Twitter bots in real-world politics. So I started to create pieces around that. And at the time I started to realize actually algorithms and systems have a real impact on sick and disabled people in the UK. As currently, the current disability system in the UK is enforced by massive IT companies such as ATAS, Maximus and Capita, all of which are, who are hired by the British government. And it's something that, this, this, this reductive system, which is the main problem with disability benefits in the UK, as systems can't feel compassion, only humans can. So, and even though there's people existing within these systems, actually, most of the time their hands are tied and they're forced to filling checkboxes and like filling quotas where they're not able to see the person for who they are and what situation they're really in. So, what you could do is you could consider the system as an automaton, a, a machine or a system that appears human from afar, but as you get closer, reveals itself what it truly is. So with this in mind, I decided to create my own automaton called At Dear Decision Maker, which is a synthetic whistleblower that replicates the system ATOS, Maximus, and Capita use in order to publicly highlight its faults. And the way this works is essentially it applies the system online on Twitter, and um, what it does is it scours the internet looking for various people, and then it diagnoses them using the same system that ATAS, Maximus, and Capita have implemented, therefore determining whether or not they would get their disability benefits based off the system. However, at the same time, it's getting it wrong most of the time, so therefore trying to prove that actually, even though it, the system says you'd get it, you know yourself whether you wouldn't or would, so therefore you kind of realize actually there's major flaws in the system that's being used. And uh, as well as it being quite a critical object, I want it to have a very practical use, so also if you directly message it, as seen on this side. Um, you can actually, the Twitter bot will actually message you back step by step the entire process of applying for a disability benefit in a hope to kind of give people who want to apply the opportunity to test it out before actually doing it. So there's kind of a, a balance that's going on there. And the final part of kind of dialogical design is the ability for real-time interaction. So for a piece to become dialogic, it must not just present one way of engaging with it, but must be able to have multiple channels of doing so, and therefore be able to bend with time and be able to place the, the human at more importance than the actual designer's piece itself. Um, so this is something that I'm starting to look at um, currently with one of my, uh, with a project I'm doing with my studio, Studio Hype. So at as well as doing activist work, I also work with my design studio. And what we're doing here, with, we're creating a, we have our own research project with this, which has been going on for the past year called The Book in the Global Village. And um, essentially this book is a book that starts to look past the kind of linear format of book at a more expansive experience of the printed page. One where conversation could be had with the content, where not only speech could be stored, but videos, sound, websites, and material and immaterial experience. So the way this works is, as well as writing content, which explores the role of the book in the global village and kind of exploring what that is and mapping out the terrain for that, we also are developing our own book, which when you tap, um, opens the online content, whether it's... Uh, and, and this content could be anything, so video, speech, interactive content. But um, yeah, this is something they're working on at the moment, where just through a simple act of a touch, you can trigger this. Uh, this is our second prototype. We're now working on our third, but we're getting quite closer and closer. The kind of visual that we're touching is actually replicated, is, is uh, represented by a kind of grid which is on the page, which is a metaphor for something that hasn't fully rendered in a book, so to show that there's actually a relationship now between the book and the global village, and actually what could that be. We're currently working out the content that we're looking for the book, um, we're fleshing out the chapters and we're going to work out what we're doing, but what actually, we're currently going to be looking for people to take part, so if you're interested and you, you want to con uh, contribute any kind of written or non-written content, let us know, we'd be really interested to hear from you, and we're going to have a crowdfunding page going up soon. So essentially throughout both my personal and studio practice, I'm trying to find a way in which dialogical design could be a more ethical way of engaging both the audience, the subject, and the design piece. And I hope to actually one day create work that considers both the subject and the participant in equal measure. Thank you.